Thank you everyone for joining us, uh, joining us this evening. I'm thrilled we're together for episode two of JNF's inaugural summer reading series. I look forward to discussing 2,000 years of Jewish humor in one night. It's an honor to introduce Stephen Shalowitz. Stephen is the host of Jewish National Fund USA's podcast, Israel Cast. And for the last eight years, he has produced and hosted the One Way Ticket Show pod podcast. In Mandarin speaker, Stephen worked for Young and Rubicam Advertising for 15 years all over China and in Singapore, where he hosted a weekend radio show before moving to work with the agency in New York. He's an exhibited photographer who travels to off the beaten path countries. He's also a JNF New York board member and on JNF's social media committee. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's author, whose love of Jewish comedy stretches from the Bible to Broad City, and who looks forward to talking about it with you. Jeremy Dauber is currently the HRN Professor of Yiddish Lit Language, Literature, and Culture at Columbia University, where he also has served as Director of the Institute for Israel and Jewish Studies and teaches in the American Studies Program. He's the author of several books on Jewish culture, comedy, and literature, including The, World, the Worlds of Shalom, Elham, and most recently, Jewish Comedy, A Serious History, the book that we're discussing tonight. Both were finalists for the National Jewish Book Award. His next two books are A History of the American Comic Books and A Biography of Mel Brooks. Please join me in welcoming a man who has used his passion for Jewish literature to foster a new generation of lovers of millennia old culture, Professor Jeremy Dauber. Stephen and Jeremy, thank you. I now turn the program over to you. All right, well, listen, thanks very much for that, Sarah. And Jeremy, it's wonderful to see you again. We were having a lot of laughs before we all came on to the call. And really, it's great to see you. Uh, and thanks so much for joining us, everybody. I see so many familiar faces here. We have 200 participants which is actually quite extraordinary. Just a couple of, of points before we get started. First, I do wanna give a shout out to JNF's um, telecommunications director. Uh, his name is Gary Buckwald. And I say that because uh, last night at 10 o'clock, my camera broke on my laptop. So Jeremy was, a excuse me, so uh, Gary rather, was able to set me up so that we can make all of this happen. So once again, thank you to Gary. And as Daniel said just a moment ago, um, we want you to be, uh, contributing here. We want to hear your questions, so please write them in the chat. I'll do my level best to get to as many as possible. I indeed have a number of questions, and in broad brushstrokes, really just to share um, with Jeremy and for Jeremy to respond. So really, without further ado, Jeremy, again, congratulations on the book. I read it cover to cover. It raised more questions than answers, actually, so lots of questions here, and I really want to begin our conversation. If you can really just share with us how you define Jewish humor, because I'm sure you get that asked ask that question quite often. How do you define Jewish humor? And really, what are some of the pitfalls when you define it? What are some of the challenges in defining what Jewish humor, what Jewish comedy is all about? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it was certainly something, as you can imagine, that I was thinking about when I started to write the book, because, um, you know, are you going to put in every knock-knock joke that's written by someone named Rosenstein, right? Or are you going to uh, how are you going to cover all of the material that's, um, you know, over 2,000 years in so many different continents? And, and so I relied for my, uh, you know, for my, my guiding light on uh, a story that was told by one of the great joke tellers, the great comic storytellers of Jewish history, the Magid of Dubno, um, one of the great sort of Jewish leaders uh, of Eastern Europe. And he would always illustrate his stories with a joke. Uh, and, and he says to, someone once said to him, well, how do you always pick the right joke for, for such an occasion? And he said, you know what, I'm going to tell you a joke to answer that, that question. And that's, that's what I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, and, and, and to start us off with a little joke, because why not? And I know you're all muted, so when I finish the punchline, just imagine 200 people laughing up there, because that's, that's what's going to happen. Um, so we're going to see them laughing, Jeremy. We're going to see them laughing. You know, so the Magid, this is the story the Magid tells. And he tells a story about a young man um, who is impressed, who is sort of captured and sort of put into the Tsarist army. Um, and he is trained, uh, like all of them, as a soldier, right? And one day, the head of the army comes uh, to, to examine the troops, all the troops, you know, and, and he sees the firing range. And, you know, people are shooting and shooting, uh, you know, at these chalk targets. And there's one set of targets 
where there are bullet holes dead center in every single chalk circle, dead center. And he says, I need to see who this remarkable marksman is. And they take him, and of course, it's this little Jew. Uh, and he says, the, the commander says, you know, you're amazing. Did you have any training? He says, what kind of training would I have? I studied Tom. You know, he says, well, how is it that you are, have, have always hit dead center every single time? He says, well, it's very easy. First, you shoot the bullet. And then when the bullet hits the wall, you look at the bullet hole, and then you draw a circle right around it. And the Magid said, look, this is what I do. I find something that hits the wall, and then I find the story that kind of goes around it. So in some sense, this is what I did with the book. I took all of the material that I said, how can this not be in a book on Jewish comedy? How is this not centrally important to the story of Jewish comedy overall? And then I tried to figure out frameworks that made sense, given that. And, and, and what, I, what I came to was saying, well, you know, there's not one explanation. Very frequently people say, Jewish comedy is this. Jewish comedy is a response to anti-Semitism. Jewish comedy is a playfulness with text because we're the people of the book or whatever. I said, well, sometimes it's this, and sometimes it's that, and sometimes it's that. And that led to the kind of different frameworks that I thought about uh, in, in, in writing a book about the history of Jewish comedy. It didn't have to be like that. And Jeremy, some of those frameworks are what? If you can share, like, what are some of the origins? Just a few to tick off in the interest of time. Sure, yeah, in the interest of time. I talk about seven in the book. We're not going to go yep. through all seven now. But, but, you know, one of them, of course, is that Jewish comedy can be a response to persecution. Right, that it can be a way, this is one that people I think are very familiar with, of coping with anti-Semitism uh, or other kinds of hostility by saying, you know, we're going to turn it into a joke and therefore as this sort of marginalized people in the diaspora, we're going to have some kind of control over it by making it into a joke. But there are other kinds too. Um, there is this kind of witty, elusive, intellectual play with words that I referred to. There's a kind of satire, both aimed outwards but also aimed inwards at Jewish community. Um, there's a kind of parody, a kind of vulgar wit of the Jewish body, which is also present, even though we don't think about it sometimes. And the last one I'll say is that there's also a kind of comedy of being often disguised and marginal in a larger society, trying to figure out exactly where we as Jews obtain in sort of a society that's much larger uh, than ours. So, yeah, because you... Because, Jeremy, you had a very interesting quote in the book. You said parodies are usually told by individuals in the margins. So that really talks to that point, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you know, one of the things about a parody, any kind of parody, if it's good, is that it comes with great love of the culture that it's parody, right? I mean, you know, if you want to make, I'm writing a book on Mel Brooks, as Sarah said, if you want to make a parody Western, you've got to love Westerns and watch thousands and thousands of these Westerns to get all the details right. But on the other hand, you've got to say, wait a minute, this isn't quite my story either, right? All these cowboys, they're not quite me. Uh, and somehow the combination of these two factors, that attachment, that desire to be part of the culture, and feeling like, you know, you're not quite part of that culture. Well, that's the Jewish story in the diaspora, at least in many ways. And that leads to, but it's also a comedian story, right, of saying, Here's the society. I love it, but I'm also not quite part of it. I look, I stand off to the side. I look a little different. Uh, and, you know, as a result, that Jewishness makes for a very good comic sensibility of parody and of some other things, too. In Yiddish culture, in its impact, especially in the context of American comedy and American humor. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, you have a lot of people who, you know, um, are in the original sort of uh, days of American mass culture, American you know, movies, television, radio, you know, who very much come from this Eastern European Yiddish sensibility. Not everyone, but, but a lot of them. Uh, and, and what they're often feeling is the sense of, I want to be an American. I want to be part of this culture. I want to tell these stories that are American stories, but also uh, I'm not quite uh, there myself. And so that juxtaposition makes for this wonderful comic sensibility. It's uh, in the Marx Brothers, you know, when uh, Groucho Marx plays these people with such fake Goyish names that, that they can't be Goyim, right? They can't be Gentiles, but they also can't be Jews either, right? But, you know, in the middle of Hooray for Captain Spaulding, you know, he looks around and he says, did someone call me Schnorrer, right? We know that, uh, you know, he's not quite 
clear about the, the framework that he's on, the, the footing that he's on, but that's what makes the comedy. And in the book, you also mentioned, just speaking of you using Yiddishisms, in the book, you also talk about Milton Berle and what happened with his wig. Oh, yes. So, you know, one of the stories about in the early days of television, this is why, you know, Milton Berle is, I'm sure all of you know, one of the pioneers of early television and very famous uh, for dressing up in women's clothing. Uh, and at one point in these early days of television, which was at that point a much more urban uh, uh, phenomenon than it was as, as the more people bought television sets, his wig came askew. And he said, oh, I think my shaitel is falling, right? My, my, the, East, the Yiddish word for kind of a, a wig worn by traditional Jewish women. Uh, and the audience, as it is told, cracked up because it was an audience of people who were much closer to the demographic in which Burl or, 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 or Sid Caesar, you know, cut his teeth in the Bush Belt hotels and tenements and what have you. This was the, many of the writers and, and sometimes a lot of the audience of, the, of early television. Uh, and it was one of the reasons why it felt so profoundly uh, Jewish. Yeah, I want to get to um, the Sid Caesars and, of course, Carl Reiner in just a short while. But I want to go back sort of uh, from an ecumenical standpoint. What does the Torah really teach us about laughter and what are rabbinic attitudes towards laughter? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, one of the things that uh, I'm often asked is, you know, where does this book start? Where does Jewish right. Calvary start? And I say, you know, all the way at the beginning. It starts in the Bible. And people say, well, is the Bible funny? Uh, is there, and I say, well, yes and no. Um, there is a great amount of humor in the Bible, even though we don't sometimes recognize it and sometimes we don't like it. So, you know, when, for example, there's the humor of God's chosen people, the Israelites, making fun of all of the, of the uh, foreign tribes that don't get with the program, that kind of satire of idol worship, that's comedy, right? You know, at the same time, um, there's also a kind of not funniness where people who have, like Sarah, in the first incidents of laughter, Sarah, you know, God's messengers come to Abraham and say, you know, thank you for your hospitality. You're going to have a child at age 100 and Sarah's 90. And Sarah laughs. She laughs ironically. She says, yeah, I know the score. Who are you kidding? Right? And, that, and, and there God says, don't laugh. Laughter is not appropriate here. What is appropriate is faith. Uh, and what comes is a child, Isaac, named after laughter, but named after a different kind of laughter kind of knowing laughter, that really it's God who has the last laugh. Human kind of ironic comedy, and that's a Hellenic, Hellenic word, right? Iron is an ancient Greek word. So that kind of human laughter, there's not as much place for that as there is for the divine kind of laughter. And in terms of rabbinic attitudes towards laughter. Yeah. So, you know, the rabbis, not surprisingly, are interested in talking about rabbinic culture. Uh, and they're interested in upholding this kind of serious intellectual endeavor. So on the one hand, they like it when laughter is a kind of spoonful of sugar that lets the rabbinic medicine go down. Uh, and they say, you know, start out your talks, your sermons with a kind of joke. And on the other hand, they say, if it's frivolousness, it, that's not so good. And on the other, other hand, because what would the Talmud be if there weren't five different opinions, sort of one after the other? there are all sorts of cases where they kind of make fun of themselves a little bit. And you, you get the sense that they're saying, I don't know that we take ourselves quite so seriously. Maybe, maybe the, a lot of this hair splitting is a little ridiculous. And that appears in the Talmud occasionally as well. So uh, the Talmud is capacious and vast. It contains volumes on comedy is no upsetting to us. Right. Um... Let's see. Uh, we have a question in before we continue. Um, let's see. Arnold writes in the story of Balaam and Balaam's ass. Are you familiar with that? I am. I mean, I think that this is a great example, not only of a kind of biblical comic scene. I think Arnold is right. Um, where you have, you know, the donkey talking to the or refusing to all of this, right? This, this wonderful, you can imagine being filmed as a kind of slapstick scene, but also a rabbinical comic pylon. They're interested in continuing uh, to make fun of Villa, of Balaam. And so they, they, talk, they, they invent a whole conversation between Balaam and his ass, in which uh, they, they are portrayed as lovers, they, they, they're sort of having a lover's quarrel and all of this. And this continues to pile on the ridicule 
of this Gentile magician uh, before he sees the light uh, and eventually sort of understands that God is in charge, right? So it continues to uphold the rabbi's view of the world while getting in some good comedic licks uh, you know, after that. So Arnold is 100% right. That's a great example. Right. And indeed, I just want to remind everybody, if you do have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat. I'll also uh, try to get to them as we move on. Um, I did want to ask about the book of Esther, because you talk about it, Nikilat Esther, all throughout your book. And you talk about it in terms of the disguises that both Mordechai and Esther wore in the book of Esther, and then also the disguises that comedians had to wear in terms of disguising their Jewishness. And I thought that was fascinating. And I had never made that connection, Jeremy. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I think that one of the things that's remarkable about the Book of Esther, and one of the reasons why it becomes such a touchstone for Jewish comedy uh, through, the, through the ages, um, is because uh, not only is it, uh, you know, told and, and read on our sort of mask, on our holiday, that like carnival as holiday, that has uh, opportunity to let loose, let your hair down, but because it's a story that really has some of the great traditions of comedy of all's well that ends well, and it's often achieved through disguise. I mean, I'll, I'll take my great Goyish authority of Shakespeare, half of Shakespeare's comedies involve someone dressing up as someone else and then revealing themselves sort of at the end. Of course, those of you who know the story of Esther know that that is, in fact, the story. Esther disguises herself and then uh, saves the day by revealing herself. And one of the most interesting things is that what she disguises herself as is a non-Jew, right? Or at least she is very uh, uh, hidden about her Jewishness. It mortifies the hest. Uh, and then one of the remarkable things for any uh, reader of this on the, on the holiday of Purim, any Jewish reader, is this proud ability to say, I am a Jew. And this is what her saves the day, her proud proclamation of her Jewish identity. Not more than that, particularly, but not less. And so that, you know, that disguise is so central to it and that, that revealing of the disguise, like it is in so much comedy. Including in Seinfeld, where the characters are indeed disguised, uh, their Jewishness is, is disguised. Uh, talk about that. And also, by the way, I'd love you to share Brandon Tartikoff's uh, viewpoint. On, okay. on Seinfeld at the very beginning, because he was very lukewarm on, on even buying it, wasn't he? That's right, 100%. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, what's interesting, and we've already talked a tiny bit about this with Groucho Marx, is that sometimes the comedy comes from the fact that it's not a very good disguise, right? It's a disguise, but it's not very good, right? Groucho Marx, can someone call me Schnorr? You know, how good is that disguise? And this was the case with Seinfeld, too, right? Where, on the one hand, uh, if you guys recall Seinfeld, watching Seinfeld, you know, um, George Costanza is not Jewish, right? He's Italian. I mean, by the narrative of the show, he's not Jewish, right? The father, Jerry Stiller, who played, you know, his father, said that he believed them to be Jews in a witness protection program, right? So that was his, his take. But they're not Jewish. And Elaine, who feels, again, like a kind of very classic, stereotypical character in Jewish-American comedy, um, is not Jewish. She has Schick's appeal, as one episode famously puts it. She crosses herself. She's not Jewish. And part of that was because, as, uh, as you're saying, um, because of NBC's president, Brandon Tartikoff at the time, who was very, very nervous, even though he was Jewish, was very nervous about having too much explicit Jewish content on, on television. Uh, after Seinfeld, there's a, a whole floodgate of, of explicit Jewish characters. But before that, there really wasn't very much. Um, and so he says, look, we can't have like, you know, we're not very comfortable about this. Uh, and that was part of the reason to, to give these, these other characters this kind of swim of, of ethnic disguise. Jerry Seinfeld had already in his stand-up routines, which made him famous, he had already uh, been outed, so to speak, as a Jew. So they didn't want to, they didn't want to change that. Um, but, but these other characters, who, if you describe them, you would say, well, he's Woody Allen, and she's, you know, a, a Jewish American princess type. Uh, they're not Jewish, technically speaking, but of course. Right. Listen, before, before we get to the questions, interestingly, though, when you think of the show Friends, yeah. you had Ross and you had Rachel, and you also had, um, what was her name? Uh, Ross's sister. Can't think of her name right now. By, yeah. Played by... Played by Courtney Cox. I can't think of her name right now. Um, 
Monica. someone write in the chat so I can remember who it was, or you, you tell me, Jeremy. But interestingly, Monica, thank you, Lori Geiger, for sharing that. Monica, there you go. Um, the brain shuts down at 8 o'clock, and it's 8.23 right now. What can I say? Um, they were Jewish, but they weren't overtly Jewish, right? There was just a hint of, I think, as you talk about it in the book, like a spritz, right? Like a spritz of, of Jewishness. I want to go to um, the questions now. First of all, thanks to Ken Moskowitz. He wrote, The Oven of Akim and God Laughs. Thank yeah. you for that. And then, let's see, we have uh, someone who did not identify themselves wrote, would the Joseph story be a comedy in a Greek comedy in them getting their come up, come up in kind of a Larry David, like everything comes together ending. Well, I'll take, I'll take those in order. Um, and thank you both. Thank you for both those questions, or both those questions and comments. Um, the oven of Achnai, right. Is a, uh, this was came up at the point when we were talking about the rabbinic materials. Mm -hmm. And it's one of these interesting, uh, very, very interesting texts. I actually talk about it in the book in which God laughs because his, his children, essentially, my children have conquered me, saying it's the rabbis who get to interpret divine law on earth um, and, uh, and not me, right? Because it is the capper to a very long story that I'm not going to tell right now, um, where people are thinking about what the particular law is in this situation involving an oven, and God himself comes down and says oh, the law is like X, and the rabbis say, eh, who asked you, you know, go home, and he laughs. And again, it's, it, it, in many ways, it's a kind of laugh like Sarah's laugh that we talked about, of saying, uh, I understand, I, I, I have wisdom, you know, I submit here to a higher authority. And what's remarkably audacious about that text, one of the reasons why it's so frequently used in 20th and 21st century uh, rabbinical reform, uh, movements, conservative reform movements, is because it really says the power is not divine. The power is now in the rabbis. The power is now in the king. Um, and so it's a remarkably important text, and it's done as a, as a comic narrative. And so I agree. You know, it shows how powerful comedy can be. In terms of the book of Joseph, uh, I think that the book of Joseph is, uh, again, it has the lineaments of classical comedy. I can't remember uh, who said this, uh, the name. I apologize. But, but whoever it was was 100% right. We have a move from you know, uh, from, from victory to defeat, literally into a pit, back up. It's accomplished through disguise. The disguise is ended by revelation. Uh, and there is even a reunion kind of at the end. All is well that ends well within that narrative. Of course, then uh, a new pharaoh arises who knows not Joseph. Uh, and then the story, you know, takes a different turn uh, in as we move from Genesis to the Exodus. But within the story itself, uh, I think that there is uh, a good bit of this. And, you, and you know, it's not surprising that when medieval Jews put on plays, comic inflected or orient, comic oriented plays around the time of Purim, the most popular story, perhaps not surprisingly, was the Book of Esther. But the second most popular story, well, the second most popular story was actually Jonah and the Whale. But the third most popular story mm -hmm. was the selling of Joseph. Right, that was a play because they understood what, what this uh, person does the, 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 the comic appeal, the theatrical and comic appeal of that story. Right, I want to go to another. First of all, Lori Geiger, thank you for pointing out that Monica from Friends did have a Christmas tree. I think she was still identified, or she's still identified as being Jewish, but of course she had a yeah. Christmas tree. And uh, before we get to the other question, Hi, Rachel, and thank you for, for writing in the chat, and it's great to see you out there. So thank you for that. Um, this comes in from James Sherman. He wrote, I'm surprised that you mentioned Sarah as the first laugh when it's Abraham who laughs first, and it's God who says that they will name their son Isaac. So I, so I think that means laughter is seen as appropriate and worthy of commemoration. It is Sarah, ultimately, who says God has given me laughter, and all that follow will laugh with me. I'm not going to get into the particular ins and outs of the of the episode. We'll, we'll right. come back at some other point and have a you know have a close reading of that one. Um, I think that the you know the speaker is is correct that Abraham and Sarah kind of battle it out in their different kinds of laughter and who says what. Um, it, it does seem to me that ultimately the story is juxtaposing Sarah's laughter uh, and God's laughter, uh, and and um, ultimately. Uh, it is in that narrative, Sarah's laughter, um, how would I put this? Sarah's laughter 
ends up being the one uh, of admission that she was wrong uh, and that God was God has the last laugh, so to speak. Okay. And I think that's the main takeaway from that episode. All right. Um, by the way, did you watch Downton Abbey? I, uh, yes, when it came out, yes. Right, when it came out, because one of my favorite lines I committed to memory, and it was from the Dowager Countess, played yeah. by Maggie Smith, who said, vulgarity is no substitute for wit. And I thought that that was such a wonderful line. And you point out that vulgarity actually has a long history in Jewish comedy. And so how far back does it go? And what are its sort of seminal points all throughout, uh, Jeremy? Well, that's a great question. I mean, you know, it, it is interesting. I don't want to uh, 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 curse on this on, on, on this call, and therefore, you know, on this event, I will not. But uh, you know, Mel Brooks was once asked, "You've been accused of vulgarity," uh, and his response to that, in denial, was to say "bull," and then to add something else, sort of afterwards. So. Uh, you know, he, he might disagree sort of about the, with the Dowager Countess there. Um, that said, uh, you know, vulgarity goes all the way back again to the Bible. And, you know, you have, if, if, you're, if you're familiar, if, uh, those of you out there, with the story of Ehud, the book of Judges, uh, it involves the ignominious defeat of an enemy of Israel um, that revolves around him being stabbed in the bathroom. Um, with a lot of scatological sort of smells and elements that kind of come out there about, uh, you know, when he, he soils himself and all sorts of things. Uh, and all of this is a vulgar degradation of the enemies of Israel. And it's supposed to, again, like we've been saying, be piling on to say kind of like, oh, this is funny, you know. Um, and we may say, oh, well, that's not, we may take the Dowager Countess line, say that's not appropriate or what have you. But it does seem like that's what they wanted to, to, to do. And you know, when I, when I teach a course on this at Columbia, I read to my students some of the material um, that is uh, from the early modern period that juxtaposes, in Yiddish, uh, that juxtaposes the Yom Kippur Vidui, the penitential prayers, with discussions of the various male endowments of patriarchs, uh, one in Hebrew, one in Yiddish. And they say, you know, the students can't believe that this was the kind of thing that was offered by rabbinical students um, to, for some extra money on their break coming home before Passover. It makes extra money. But the truth is that we can have uh, the most, Jews have bodies, Jews like to make fun of their bodies, as much as they like to make fun with their brains. And it's both those, those things that are pieces uh, of the kind of story that we want to tell. All right. We have about 10 minutes left, though. But, you know, if, if people want to stay on, maybe about 10, 12 minutes left. Um, there, uh, let's see. Stuart Ornstein, thank you for this question, because he wanted to know if you have any comments on Mrs. Maisel and her comedy. Um, and I want to add on to Stuart's question, because it's something that we started to talk about a little bit earlier on, uh, before we, we came on. And it's this notion of the portrayal of Jews that isn't always the best portrayal, right? Yeah. And uh, sometimes does not show Jews in the best light. So if you can address Mrs. Maisel, and then also that topic as well. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Someone asked me once, you know, what, uh, what I thought of Mrs. Maisel. And I said, you know, I always wanted to know what it would be like if the Gilmore girls were all Jewish. Uh, and this is sort of what I, this is what I felt like. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, it's, written, it's by the same person, by Amy Sherman Palladino. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, there's a, there's a great deal of cleverness to the show. I actually enjoy it quite a bit, but it's true that much of that cleverness revolves around extremely clever, you know, manipulations of stereotypes. Uh, that, that, and, and I think that that's something that in, in comedy sort of you frequently want to look at is to say, is it the ability to kind of go beyond uh, a certain stereotype to get to something deeper about sort of characters? And I'm not always convinced that, uh, you know, with, even with all the hours and all the budget that, that, you know, Amazon is able to give them, that they've been able to do that. That said, you know, um, if you're looking for sort of superficial delights uh, in it, you know, there, there, there's, there's certainly what to be had there, both on the basis of the, the laughing and, and the wonderful sort of production values. Um, I will say, though, that that question of stereotypes, you know, is very, very complicated. And, and, and I think that a lot of it depends on the execution. So one of the things 
you know, we've, we've mentioned very briefly Larry David. Um, but one of the things that David is capable of doing on his best days, which are not always, but on his best days, of which there are many, is to play into these stereotypes, to present himself as almost the avatar of these stereotypes, but do it in such clever ways that it somehow seems to put an entirely different spin uh, on the unpleasant, miserly, you know, Jew or the character of the Jew against the Christian. Or, you know, there's one point in which he portrays himself as engaging in the most, not only the most uh, old ranging, but most dangerous Jewish stereotype of all, the, the one who um, eats the, the baby Jesus. Uh, and he does it in such a clever way. He has a sort of Christmas cookie diorama, um, you know, that his in-laws have put in, his Christian in-laws, and he eats it. Then he gets away with it, you know, I think in a remarkable kind of way. So I think that uh, it, it, a lot of it depends on the execution. I guess I right. Say. Absolutely. Um, we have a couple of wonderful questions, which um, I also wanted to ask you about, because we really would be remiss if we didn't bring up Carl Reiner, yeah. given that he just passed away in his role in comedy, in comedy in the United States. And also, if you can dovetail that onto Sid Caesar as well, who is really the godfather of them all. Yeah, well, I think when, you know, when it comes to television, there's no question that Caesar you know, is, you know, he, he shaped, I mean, that writer's room, he shaped American group of comedy for decades after him. Uh, you know, the, the list, uh, I think everyone probably here knows this list of people. But, um, you know, Caesar, and he was the first to say this, he would say this, he would say ads to say it, he would say it, Caesar's enormous, enormous personal talent would not have been nearly as successful without sort of this, this incredible group of writers to shape that kind of raw charisma and physical vitality. Uh, and one of the people who was the most responsible for that was Carl Reiner. Reiner himself was a virtuoso with Caesar, uh, and then with Mel Brooks, of course, in the 2000 Year Man Man Shows, and then later as a director um, on the you know, on Dick Van Dyke show, and then with the Steve Martin movies, in taking all of these things, and, 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 and like an opera conductor, sort of shaping the tonal color uh, of this stuff in order to provide uh, the comedy to keep it going. He was really an artist. And like a lot of times, uh, you don't necessarily recognize his artistry as much as the big, bold, bright, brassy talent, whether that be you know, Sid Caesar or Mel Brooks. But, but Reiner really was you know, a, a remarkable genius for finding and understanding the funny uh, and getting to it and, 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 and you know, shaped fundamentally uh, post-war Jewish comedy as much as, as, as some of the bigger names did. So, so you know, Absolutely. And we want to thank Ira Epstein for, for raising that one. Um, also, a word or two about Jack Benny, Deborah Glazer would like to know. Yeah, well, Benny, I think, is a fascinating case, um, not only because, uh, you know, he is just a great, a great comic figure in his own right. Uh, in the 1940s, his voice was the most, rec this is true, the most recognized voice in radio. The second most recognized voice was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Okay, so that's how famous he was. Um, and what's interesting is that you read his, his writer's auto, you know, autobiographies, you read some things, is that it was not clear to many of these people who recognized his voice that, that he was a Jewish comedian. So it's one of these interesting bifurcations in the way that people think about sort of these kind of histories in which we say, well, of course, Jack Benny, he had this whole miserly personality that he played above. He was actually, uh, he was the first person to be referred to as a schnook. Uh, on, uh, you know, on, on, I think on television, actually, on the TV show. Uh, of course he was Jewish, right? Of course he was a Jewish comedian. But most people uh, did not, apparently, did not think so. And there's actually uh, some interesting kind of proof of this um, where, you know, very on brand for him, he had like a radio contest. And he wanted, the contest was, I want people to write in, to write in why I hate Jack Benny. Right, so that's Jack Benny's contest, why you hate me so much, right? That's the kind of character he played. And he told his writers to separate out, he was very worried about this, to separate out any anti-Semitic responses that he got. And the contest garnered about uh, 150,000, I don't remember the exact number, but you know, well over 100,000 responses. And of all of those, three of them were anti-Semitic. And the writers say, like, we don't think this is because there were only three anti-Semites out there in 1940. We think it was because a lot of people didn't recognize him that way. So it's this great question about 
some of the character, and I would get this when I started lecturing about Seinfeld many years ago, where people would say, well, it's how Jewish really is Seinfeld as a show? And, you know, people would say, well, uh, of course it was. And other people would say, no, it's not Jewish at all. It's just New York. You know, it's just these crazy urbanites. Right. So, I have to tell you, you know, we opened up the floodgates to the chat and to questions, and we have some wonderful, wonderful questions. And I really apologize to everybody that I don't think in the interest of time we're going to get to everyone. But if, I think if we spend maybe about five or so more minutes, you know, five, six more minutes, if everyone's okay with that, we'll just try and sort of field them. And I think I'm just going to throw some names out at you in the interest of time so that you can just respond to them. Um, and I'm, uh, let's see, um, we've had several people asking about Joan Rivers. And I think if you talk about Joan Rivers, can you um, talk about the context of Joan Rivers vis-a-vis -vis the, the scope of female comedians, female Jewish comedians? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and it, it does do, uh, I would say, unfortunately, a disservice to sort of Jewish female comedians to sort of limit them. And you're not, that's not what you're doing, of course, but to, to, to say, yeah. oh, well, that's one person standing for all. There's a great trajectory. And thankfully, because uh, barriers uh, to comedy, barriers to women performing in comedy are getting a little lower, they're not gone, they're getting a little lower. You know, we're seeing more and more great talent uh, 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 being able to have a chance to express itself. But, uh, you know, Rivers really, you know, she was one of these great, remarkable comedians for decades. And, you know, she, one of the things that I think was, was, was amazing about her was that she, from a very early period, understood that not only the power of talking about your life, but that your life changed over the years and the decades that you performed. And she was very fearless and open about first portraying herself as uh, a young Jewish woman who, uh, whose parents, all they, all they wanted for her was to be sort of normal, and by normal for her, that in her act, at least that meant married, right? Uh, you know, she would sort of have these signs, well, last Jew on freeway that the mother would put up, you know, that thing. Um, and then as she got older, saying, you know, one of the things about being a woman, right, is, uh, you know, my openness to a sexual desire, but also the fact that my body is not what it once was, and, and she was very open about the struggles that she had uh, with, with, with how she felt about how she looked. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, what, what it made her was not only an inspiration to generations of comedians, Jewish and non-Jewish, but really one of the most fearless uh, of the comedians, of the stand-up comedians, uh, um, you know, and really not, you know, not being afraid to say anything about herself uh, and how she looked. So, so I, you know, I'm a tremendous admirer. Right, and she was inspired by Lenny Bruce, wasn't she? She was. I mean, she, you're absolutely right. She was. She she said, you know, in, in some ways, it's hard to think about uh, two two comedians that are that are that are more different. But on the other hand, by the way that I've been introducing it, you can really see the similarities of her saying Bruce was fearless about putting himself in the act. Uh, I I have to tell my truth, uh, and Bruce was very inspirational. Sure, and, and um, some of our wonderful group members pointed out other women comedians. We had, of course, Tody Fields, we had Gilda Radner, uh, and so many, uh, Molly Goldberg, for example, right? And that's a whole- about Molly Goldberg. Yes, because, please, go ahead. Because Goldberg, I mean, Goldberg, you know, all of these women that, that, that have been mentioned, you really are, are, are great talents. But Goldberg, I think, you know, uh, in, in, let's say, this generation, certainly of my students, uh, is really unknown, and this is a crying shame because not only was she just a remarkable uh, uh, writer and a remarkable performer, but she was, uh, you know, a fearless entrepreneur uh, and, and, and challenge. You know, she took her own destiny into her hands um, when she pitched a, a story. This is a great, a great narrative. She pitched her own sort of show. She made sure to write it in in bad handwriting. She hand wrote the pitch so that no one could read it except for her. So she had to be in the room in order to read it. And then she performed it so well that they said, hey, why don't you play this person? She said, you know, I thought you'd never ask, kind of thing. Um, and, 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 and she was a, a major behind the scenes person in television, first in radio and then television, when, uh, you know, it was very rare for women to be that. And, and, and so just a remarkable figure uh, that needs to cherish. Right. Her. I think just in the interest of time, I think let's just get to two more points. Okay. One is Borschfeld, and the second one is Norman Lear and his place in the comedic tradition, both from the Jewish standpoint, but also in the American comedic tradition. Yeah. So first go with Borschfeld. Yeah, so I, you know, they both come, even though they're, they're not exactly identical, they both come with a piece, which is Jewish specificity becoming American generality. Right. So, you know, you have 
the early days of television, you know, you have people saying, look, this is a New York-based institution. It's live. Uh, it, it looks a lot like variety shows, but it needs to be new every week. Who do we know that's kind of nearby who's used to putting on first-class entertainments for a very demanding audience every week? And they just looked up the Catskills and they said, you know. And just on a constant basis. I mean, they were just churning out so many skits and routines, weren't they? Yeah. I mean, to be able to say, you know, with your show of shows, we're putting on 90 minutes of new material, you know, every, every week. Just, you know, it's an incredible, it's an incredible achievement. Uh, and, and they said, look, you know, people like Max Friedman, the producer, uh, and, and, and Caesar and his writers, they were used to it. This is, this is what their lives were in the mountains. So, and that became the basis of American comedy. And, and I think that was the same thing with Norman Lear, where, you know, he takes something like All in the Family, and you have him say, his autobiography, which I recommend to everybody, it's a wonderful autobiography. He says, um, you know, I basically just took dialogue in my house, and I put it in the mouths of the characters on All in the Family. Um, mm. And in that way, you know, what seems to be uh, sort of a, you know, a, 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 a not Jewish American environment really has this Jewish substrate underneath. And I think in many ways, Norman Lear, as a result, he is the story of American popular culture in that way. He takes this Jewish story and he says, this is a story that resonates with all of America. Uh, and certainly in many ways, in very different ways for all the family, people took different things out of it. Uh, but, but, you know, in many ways it did. So that's a, that's a great way of, unfortunately, by, it's not yeah. By, by the way, just before we wrap, though, um, can you just share real briefly what Norman Lear's mother allegedly told him? You okay. know where I'm going with that one. Tell the whole story, because we were talking about that before we uh, came yeah, on. Before, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, this, you know, this is a kind of, uh, it, 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 it was asking me whether I think it's real or not, and it's hard to tell, but as the story goes, you know, Norman Lear, um, uh, you know, he is getting some massive lifetime achievement award. I think it was the, the Comedians Hall of Fame or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and he says to his mother, you know, Ma, you know, I made it. I, you know, they're going to they're gonna induct me into the Television Hall of Fame. And, you know, and the, and, and the mother says, well, you know, if that's what they want, who am I to stand in their way? <laughs> <laughs> this is, you know, again, is this sort of just a Jewish mother or is this? But, you know, one of the things that they say about comedians uh, very frequently is that they're looking for love. They look for love from their audience. They look for love for, from, from, you know, from all, from, from entertaining America, uh, entertaining the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe you can see a little bit of a key of that there. I, well, listen, Jeremy, this was really such a treat. Once again, the book is called Jewish Comedy, A Serious History. And let me tell you, it's really serious. You've got a whole bunch of notes in the back here. Oh, well. There's, it's a lot of annotations here. So you've done a lot of research into this book. So really, congratulations. Um, just two quick things. The first one is August 19th. We have our next book group. It's uh, The Ten Commandments of Character. Rabbi Joseph Telushkin is the featured author. So do sign up for that. And Jeremy, really, before we wrap and hand it over to Sarah, can we ask you just to tell another joke? Uh, okay, sure. You know, I'll tell one, I'll tell one very quick joke because I know it's sure. late and it's, you know, it's a Right. But uh, it is a joke and that Milton Berle... Well, by the way, you know what they say about Jews? Jews, what do they say? Jews um, say goodbye but never leave. We were going to leave about 10 minutes ago, so there you go. There you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, this is a joke. We mentioned Milton Berle before. Apparently, I've been told this is a joke that he liked to tell. Uh, and it is a joke, as, he, as, as I've been told that Berle told it, uh, about uh, Dwight Eisenhower uh, and the President Dwight Eisenhower and that he took a trip to Israel. Uh, and in this, you know, and, and in this trip, uh, he's met by, of course, David Ben Gurion, the Prime Minister. And Ben Gurion asks him if he would like to see the tomb of the unknown Jewish soldier. Uh, and Eisenhower says, "Well, you know, of course. I mean, I'm a general. I was a general myself. I'd like to see, uh, you know, I'd like to see his tomb." And and you know, it, 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 they say, "Okay." So so Ben Gurion takes him to to uh, the, the graveyard uh, and the cemetery, and he takes him in front of this gigantic tombstone. And it says, here lies Hyman Rosenfarb Furrier. And, you know, Eisenhower is a little bit taken aback. He says, you know, I, I thought you said this was the tomb of the unknown Jewish soldier. And, you know, uh, Ben Gurion says, well, yes, as a soldier, he was unknown. But as a furrier, he was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all very much for your time. <laughs> thank you, Jeremy. Okay, listen, thanks, everybody. And over to you, Sarah.
Thank you. Thank you all for joining tonight. Um, it was incredible. I laughed. Um, uh, definitely smiled a lot tonight. So thank you so much, Jeremy. And thank you, Stephen, for hosting. Um, and thank you all for joining tonight's conversation. Uh, we hope you enjoyed tonight's uh, programming. There's one more episode, as Stephen mentioned, um, in the summer reading series. It's August 19th, same time, 8 p.m. Eastern, the Ten Commandments of Character, Essential Advice for Living an Honorable, Ethical, Honest Life with Rabbi Joseph Telushkin. Uh, please buy your books on Amazon Smile to support JNF and register today. Jewish National Fund is helping meet the urgent needs brought about by the time of uncertainty and change, and your support is needed now more than ever. Please consider donating today. There's a donate link in, um, in the chat. Again, thank you all for joining. Please feel free to check out IsraelCast. It's again hosted by Stephen, and this will be recorded and shared on JNF's YouTube page um, tomorrow. Thank you again so much for joining, and um, until next time, take care. <laughs>